11 o'clock. I'm on my computer, so let's go. That's correct. Uh, it says here, the agenda. I have copies of the agenda, so I'll pass it out. Agenda, everyone. I'll just go around the table here and take a copy. It says, uh, members present or absent. I'm going through a sheet here and check people on or off. I don't think we need to have a roll call unless everybody thinks we do. Maybe three questions? Or well, I'll, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, and uh, now we have to say that this, we're on, uh, on TV today. We have an a audio and a visual recording going on. And so now we're at the fourth item on the agenda. It says committee member introduction. Uh, and I suggest we just go around the table and then introduce ourselves and maybe tell a little bit about ourselves. We don't need biographies or anything like that, but just some sense of who you work for, or why you're here, but some idea. So all of us have some concept of who we are as a committee. And so I'll start. Uh, I'm Emory Ford. I was asked to kind of organize this uh, by Paul Spector, and through some fits and starts, here we are. Uh, I'm retired. I live in Florence. I'm 72 years old. I'm a scientist by vocation and avocation, uh, a self-proclaimed grump, so I, I don't uh, suffer fools well, and I'm, I'm likely to ask very direct questions, uh, and I'm a great fan of numbers. If I can't count it, <laughs> I usually don't understand it. And so with that said, let's just go this way around. Okay. I'm Norma Roach from Ward 1, and I don't have any direct experience that brings me here, but I'm a whitewater kayaker, so I care about clean rivers. And I've also done a lot of volunteering with the Broadbrook Coalition with the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. In my day job, I'm a freelance editor and a little bit of a writer. My name's Dan Felton. Um, I live in Ward 2. Um, I work for a company uh, in town uh, called Environmental Compliance Services. I'm an environmental engineer, chief technical officer for the company. We do a lot of uh, compliance, stormwater, spill plan, um, brownfield development, those types of, of activities. So I'm, I'm fairly well versed in, in some of the issues that we'll be looking at, um, but as a resident, very interested in the outcome. I'm David T. So I live in Florence, uh, I live at 66. I work at Northampton Plumbing Supply. I'm a master plumber by trade. Uh, I do know about stormwater, how to generate it. I actually <laughs> grew up with uh, Ed Honey in Southampton. I've been uh, friends for a long time, and, and I was asked by the mayor to be part of the committee. Uh, I'm Rick Clark. I lived in Northampton about 25 years. Uh, on William Street, about 15 years. Um, I own and operate a, a small company that does pipe inspections, so I'm pretty familiar with pipe systems. And um, I was asked by Owen to, to be on this uh, committee, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I know it's sort of a punch in the stomach, but <laughs> we're, we're here, and I'm glad to be here. My name is Megan Murphy-Wolf. Um, Pamela Schwartz asked me to be here. I'm in Ward 4, so that's pretty much why I'm here. My background is on Capitol Hill. I work for two members on the budget committee, so I enjoy budget things and numbers. numbers. So that's probably really why she asked me to be here. My name is Ruth McGrath. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've been asked by Marianne LaBarge, Ward 6 City Councilor, to be here. I'm the Ward 6 Secretary for the Ward 6 Association. Uh, my background is in computers. I'm a retired federal employee from Washington. Uh, moved back home here. Um, right now, I'm unemployed as far as full-time. I'm the school crossing guard in front of Ryan Road School. I'm the one that waves to everybody. Um, I'm also part-time employed by Adam Cohen. I record various city meetings for him, including this one. Put them up on the North Street Association website, so if you want to see all the meetings, including this one, that's where you go. You go to YouTube, that search for North Street Association. Um, I also teach classes and volunteer at the Senior Center. And obviously, uh, being a homeowner in Florence, we're very, very interested in this and uh, any other taxes that are coming our way. So, very interested in making this work. Yeah. 
I'm Bob Reckon. I'm a design and build contractor. Uh, moved to Northampton about 35 years ago. I've served the city in a number of different ways. Most important of which for this meeting perhaps is I was on the Board of Public Works for 15 years, chairman for seven. So I'm quite familiar with how enterprise systems operate, and I'm sure that's be one option we consider seriously about thinking about how we're going to pay these costs. Um, John Shinnett, I'm the Associate Vice President for Facilities at Smith College. Uh, Non-Mass resident, non-Northampton uh, resident, or resident of uh, Thompson, Connecticut, for an hour and a half from here. Um, been at Smith five years, um, oversee all the capital development, infrastructure planning, so I'm kind of familiar with some of the, the needs that are here. I uh, have experience in the city of Worcester. I was a civil engineer back in the early 80s, not to date myself. Um, so I look forward to this. Uh, I think this will be an interesting, interesting task. Uh, my name is Ned Huntley. I'm currently director of Public Works. <clears throat> I live just over Turkey Hill Road in West Hampton. I'm not a Northampton resident, but I do have a, a vested interest in all the infrastructure in Northampton. I'm very happy to be here. It's, uh, we've been working on this for a couple of years, and it's finally come to a fruition that Hopefully, an end to it. Or the beginning. <laughs> 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 You're right. I'm Jim Marlis. I'm Jim Marlis, city engineer. Um, work with Ned in the uh, public works department, uh, resident of Florence, and non voting member of the task force. They're just uh, I'm Terry Paul <coughs> Um live here in town. I've had a business here in town, Tripod Audio, for about 40 years, a little over 40 years. And uh, Mary Ford appointed me to the Board of Public Works back in the mid-90s. Um, I'm not a member of the committee. I'm here to give you a brief overview this evening of what our stormwater infrastructure looks like, uh, the situation we find ourselves in in terms of mandates, and uh, a brief overview of the budget numbers as we see them so far. I'm Chris Hellman. I'm the um, designee from the Board of Public Works to this committee. Um, I'm actually a Ward 2 resident. Uh, I grew up in Northampton, did a 25-year uh, detour in Washington, D.C., where I worked uh, doing federal budget stuff, so you and I are going to have to compare notes. <laughs> and I now, uh, I now I'm still doing federal budget analysis at a group called the National Priorities Project here in Northampton. Great group. Thanks, Alex. I'm Alex Geesland. I'm from Ward 5. Um, I guess my most relevant uh, is was city council. I represented Ward 5 and city council for four terms. I'm very familiar. Uh, for the first two terms, flooding on the Elm Street uh, Brook area was a major concern. Uh, so I got to learn a lot about how water flows through the city and how politics flows through the city. And it was clear that, uh, that Cooley Dickinson nine acres of impervious surface was contributing to it. But when they, um, when the opportunity came, when they had a major expansion, I think in 2003 or four, when they started the planning, uh, during the MEPA review, it became very clear that they uh, had incrementally uh, put more and more impervious surface down and had not paid much attention to it. And to their credit, they hit the bullet and they uh, put in oversized retention ponds, They very careful of the wetlands under the supervision of both the DPW and our Conservation Commission. And at the end of that project, and since then, the kind of endemic flooding on Elm Street Brook has, has really gone away. Uh, so um, I guess my lesson from that is that while that's not really the point of this committee, looking at regulations and, um, and land use, but it seems to me a corollary that it would be difficult for me to, to vote uh, to increase uh, fees or taxes on people if I didn't think that the city was really doing everything it could in a regulatory way to reduce and mitigate uh, stormwater. And I think that uh, I'm not in any position to judge it, but the new zoning regulations that are being uh, are working their way towards city council both reduce um, minimum lot size, and also the open space requirement. And I hope that the DPW and people will look at that. Uh, uh, and if it has an impact on flooding, make the case. I'm Doug McDonald. I also work in the engineering department at the DPW. And uh, I work primarily on stormwater. 
I live and live and breathe this stuff as you guys are talking about. Um, I also live in Florence. Uh, so we've gone around the table, we kind of know who one another are, at least as a starting point. So the next uh, item is to uh, elect a committee chair of this as yet unofficial committee, because I read in the paper, thanks to Ruth, that they're voting tonight to make us official. So yep. if you vote for the committee chair too soon, he'll, he or she will be chair of an unofficial committee. And I don't know how that's going to work. But, uh, so I think we should go forward with that process. Yeah, I mean, might I suggest, it seems to me it's pretty early for us to pick a chairman. We'd be, I'd be much more comfortable doing that at the end of this meeting. Well, we've had one, one opinion on the, the uh, table here as to how to do it. Has somebody else got another opinion? I, my role here uh, is to get a... a have the meeting, and before we leave, have a chair elected. I mean, that's the purpose of um, having this meeting. And personally, I don't care one way or another whether we do it first, last, or whatever. But we are not leaving. I'm not doing it. <laughs> the doors are going to lock. You can't go out. In the dark. Well, I'll, uh, I'll second uh, Mr. Hughes' <coughs> suggestion. It seems like it makes sense to get a feel for who we are. You want to make, I'll make a motion to move item five down to uh, right after item nine. Uh, well, I'm not of a mind we need to make motions to, to proceed here. If we can just do it by consensus, let's just do it. I don't think we have to record a vote on it unless the rest of the committee is. Uh, okay. Once we have a chair, he or she may vote differently. But, right, but we don't have that now, so let's, uh, let's, uh, I'm, I'm not one for motions and voting and all that stuff. I, I think consensus is probably a better way to go. Uh, so then it says, read the charge to the committee. Well, uh, since we don't have a chair, we can't read it, but we can turn this agenda over and we can look at the charge. This was sent to me by Paul Spector, and, and I believe this is what... The, the city fathers have in mind for us. Can I get another copy of that? I'll oh, sure. That. Sure. All right, can you tell us how we're going to be officially constituted, who we'll report to, those kind of things? <laughs> well, no, I can't. Uh, uh, what I know is that Paul Spector asked me uh, to put the committee together, in the sense to get a group of people together. Uh, we were going to elect a chair. That was one of the orders of business. We were going to hear from Terry about the, kind of the general picture and some other commentary. And then if I read the charge correctly, we will develop a set of recommendations. We'll go to the city councilors. They're going to make the, the decision. We have the power to recommend. They have the power to decide. And so... To all the city councilors, the joint committee, I'm just looking for some clarity here. Harry? My understanding is we are a subcommittee of the joint committee between the city council and the Board of Public Works. <clears throat> Years ago, um, I'm talking while well, in the 90s, um, there was a big snowstorm that left many of the streets in the city with several inches of ice. And at the time, it was a hot issue because the mayor and the director Public Works were feuding at the time. And one of the outcomes of that problem was that this joint committee was formed. And so it's been in place for about 14, 15 years. This committee meets once a month just to sort of make sure the city council is on, up to speed with what the Board of Public Works is doing. Um, so my understanding is we are a subcommittee of that committee. We'll report to them, and then they in turn will take it okay. to the full council. Fine. So fine. And that committee is, who is on that committee? At the moment, it's Gene Casey, uh, Paul Spector, and um, Jesse Owens. No, Jesse, Jesse Adams. Adams. And from the, so we're reporting to those city councilors, not the BPW members of the joint committee. Is that correct? No, I, I think it's to that committee, but clearly the city councilors on that committee are the, the relevant people in this case. And who are the BPW members 
of the Joint Committee? Uh, Mike Parsons, MJ Adams, and myself. Okay. I suggest this. We'll send Paul a note, and we'll ask him to send us what he believes is the exact reporting relationship. And we'll get that squared away. And at the next meeting, we'll tell everybody how it's really supposed to be, as best as we know. Yeah, I think that's the simplest that's thing. That's great. Thank you. Well, we can't really do seven, I think, until uh, until we do uh, election of the chair. So did we review the charge? I don't, don't want to jump ahead. Everybody had a chance to read that? Um, Somebody could read it out loud so we all hear it. I'd be happy to read it and Great. maybe also a brief editorial comment at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so the charge of the committee is provided by Council Inspector. The City of Northampton faces significant new expenses to maintain our stormwater drainage system. Though all the work is needed and beneficial, <laughs> it is not a matter of choice. The federal government is mandating the improvements. In the past, this system has been funded by the General Fund. The Stormwater Task Force has the following charge. To deliberate in public and conform to the principles of best practices, with a reference there to the city document on best practices. To examine ways in which these costs could be funded, looking at what other communities have done in our own enterprise fund system. Recommend the general principles which should guide the new funding, with particular focus on equity and transparency. Offer recommendations <coughs> on the actual formulas that might be employed. Uh, my, my editorial comment, I guess, is um, when Terry makes his presentation a little bit later um, in, in the evening, Terry, he's going to touch on what the specifics are that are driving the need for the task force to meet. And uh, one, one element that didn't really get conveyed within the charge is there's, there's actually more than just uh, stormwater. There's a lot of flood control related demands, um, obligations that the city has from the Army Corps of Engineers, things that we need to do for the city's flood control. Terry's going to talk about that, and that's an important component of what the task force is going to be considering. So it's, I think the charge is a little broader than, than Paul had written, and I think the other uh, thing I wanted to comment on is it, at some point we'll need to talk about schedule, how frequently the group wants to meet, um, how long you want to meet, what the key factors for decision making um, need to be. And I think there's a, a number of things that'll that'll come out as you move along. It's this is something that the board of public works and DPW has been working on for the better part of a year or more. So I, I think we could be a resource, good resource for the task force to provide information and to give you information to think about and deliberate as, as the issues come up. Can I read something else? Can I read? Uh, <laughs> should we ask Paul to revise the charge? If you in fact think it's not sufficiently grown enough, let's let's get it on the table. I think we all understand it clearly enough based on what Jim has said. Right. So I, don't I, mean, I mean, let's get as much clarity yeah. as we can get so that we don't get part way down the path and, and then say, oh dear, we should be doing this, or just as bad, we shouldn't be doing this. I'm not a voting member, but it would seem to me is a consensus of this task force <clears throat> that stormwater drainage system in the city includes flood control. If it does, then that's an inclusive charge. Uh, it's part of our stormwater system. In, in my mind, uh, clarity is the best possible thing. And to achieve that, let's get the words on a piece of paper. Right. Let's, let's not, this business of inferring, uh, and get into a lot of trouble with that. Sure. Let, uh, let's ask mm -hmm. Paul to go back and relook. I'll ask him specifically, uh, or somebody will ask him, uh, do you mean flood control? And if you do, put it in. But we want to know it. Can't hurt. Yeah. Emory, is there a timeline that the BPW has been working on for a year? <clears throat> what, what is, what is uh, we're talking about scope are we working on for, for a time uh, I think Terry, will, when okay. he gives his presentation, will kind of lay out that timeline. Uh, as I understand it, they want it done yesterday. Obviously, okay. that's not going to happen. Uh, but, but there's a certain amount of urgency here to we get on with things. Months. Uh, would be a three months, something on that order, three or four months at the most. So, uh, the city council needs to, if if the committee decides that some kind of fee arrangement makes sense, the city council, and if we hope that that would be come into play for FY15, beginning in the summer of next year, <clears throat> the 
the city council needs to begin um, its work uh, around the Labor Day. Well, maybe we need to get uh, Brother Specter to lay that timeline out for us. Just let him write it down. So then we know what. I agree, I like deadlines. I don't like them, but they're helpful. Yes. March, April 15th is coming up. It's a deadline, and I'm not too enthusiastic. <laughs> but you know, when it's due. Do. Uh, do we need more commentary about the, the chart? We'll, we'll get Paul to uh, uh, flesh this out a bit and include an agenda or a, a, you know, a timeline in the chart because I think that should be part of the chart. This is what we want from you, and this is when we want it. Well, number, we come to number eight now, so I think Terry's geared up to go. <clears throat> Remember that? Uh, thank you. Uh, can, we get a, can the committee get a copy of this presentation to put in the record? Sure. We have, uh, before Terry starts, just in on regard thing. to the presentation, mm -hmm. we can send it to people. We've also posted a number of... Uh, Meeting. Documents I'll have to and I can send a, a link to everybody on the committee so they can go to the website and there's a lot of background information. Can take it over there. I'll be happy with the link. That's good enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. Uh, it's going to be hard to read because it's an angle. With the link. Oh, yeah, you're yeah. right. Everybody else happy? Let's see. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. So, link is good. Yes. Yeah. So, some of you have heard parts of this or all of this at various times. I apologize in advance for belaboring things which have become obvious. But let's start with the obvious. Storm water is rainwater and snow melt. It impacts the city in a number of ways. If it's local, uh, we need drainage systems to move it away from our streets uh, to prevent erosion, to um, keep the streets safe for cars and pedestrians. If it's happening up in Vermont, we're in danger of river flooding, encroaching into the city through the meadows or the Mill River uh, after it goes through uh, Smith College's pond. If you stand in a typical street, there are three sets of pipes below most pavement. There's the drinking water pipes. We're not talking about those. This has nothing to do with those, nor does it have anything to do with the drinking water enterprise fund. They're the sewer pipes. Again, separate fund altogether. This has nothing to do with sewer. So we're strictly talking about naturally occurring surface water and how it can impact the city in different ways and the infrastructure that we've put into place to protect the city in various ways from that surface water. So there were a series of floods back in the 30s, and I'm sure there were even earlier, and in response to that, just before World War II, the Army Corps of Engineers built the uh, dike system to protect the city. Um, basically, you see the uh, exit 18 on Route 91, here's Pleasant Street, the intersection up there at the corner of Main Street. We've got this big levee system here. Um, and then we have a smaller one here over by Smith College. The athletic fields at Smith are here, the uh, gym, the physical plant. Basically what they did back in the 30s was they diverted the river. You can see remnants of the original Mill River here. It used to flow through the pond, or I don't even know if there was a pond, frankly. Was, was there a pond always? No, it, it, it was not the size that it is now. Okay. Um, that really took its shape in the removal. All right. So the, the Mill River used to flow down between Conn Street and Pleasant Street. Down through there, crossed over under the railroad tracks, and then exited here. Um, it's, I think it's worth keeping that historical riverbed in mind. It plays into our drainage system. It plays into our flood control system in a number of ways. In any event, what the Army built were over a mile of these levees, and they diverted the Mill River so that exit it down by um, the OK lane motors.
if we didn't have the dike system, if there was a, a real high water mark, such as you might have in the middle of a really serious hurricane coming up the valley and maybe stalling in our area, <clears throat> we would get flooding. You can see the, the, the outline of the dike here. We would get flooding all the way up Pleasant Street, Con Street, into the neighborhoods over here. And as examples of that, we don't have any recent examples because we've had these dikes for 70 years. But this is a picture from before the dikes, looking at the Hotel Northampton up here, looking at Pleasant Street, Fitzwillies, and the, and the uh, Truck Eating Bridge. So those are the areas that are susceptible to flooding. Again, that would be the Connecticut River encroaching up that Mill River stream bed into those historical low spots down around Conn Street, Pleasant Street. And the river still wants to come. I mean, it, it, it hasn't forgotten about this. <laughs> uh, just as a point of uh, interest, uh, there is uh, a lot of property in that flood, flood prone area. Second feature, and a really important feature of the dike system, is the pump station. <clears throat> At all times, under normal situations, this little channel is open to allow water on the city side of the dike to slip under the dike and off to the Connecticut River. These are the pump outlets with the, the flaps there for when the pumps have to be turned on. These are huge pumps. Um, I think these engines were used in PT boats back in World War II. They're antique engines. They don't make them anymore. They don't make parts for them anymore. Um, I'm sure they were readily available in the 30s, but not anymore. <laughs> so we have three of these, um, three engines driving three of these pumps. They're incredibly powerful pumps. They would fill up an in in-ground backyard pool in nine or ten seconds. Those big trucks that bring gasoline to the gas stations, two seconds. <clears throat> they move a lot of water. Um, again, think about this. Think about the Mill River bed. This side of the dike, in the in event of a heavy rainstorm, becomes a lake. All of the water that falls up along Smith College, up toward Round Hill, the neighborhoods up on um, uh, State Street, the downtown area, it's all going this way. <clears throat> when it gets to the levee, this would be down by the uh, water treatment plant behind the was it a Sunoco station or a Shell station there across the bowling alley? If the Connecticut River were to be high and we were getting significant rain, think hurricane, that sort of a thing, we need to force the water out because if we didn't close off that channel I showed you, the water would be coming this way. The other occasion when the pumps need to be turned on is if we're getting locally heavy rain at a time when the river is not high. There's so much water at that point that it won't go through that little square channel. We have to, again, turn the pumps on. Happens a few times every summer that we have so much water on this side that high water or not, we need to turn the pumps on to excavate the water out or evacuate the water. Uh, this was uh, during the hurricane uh, in uh, 2010 or 2011. Um, there was enough locally heavy rain that the Mill River, after it exited through the Smith College, went over the dam at the Smith College Pond, was in danger of hitting the bridge where Route 66 goes over that little river. Uh, once it hit the, the bridge, if it had happened, the underside of the bridge, the whole thing would slow down. It would have quickly come up over this, run down through the skateboard park, and, and again, tried to follow that historical Mill River bed. Okay, <clears throat> so that's a, a brief overview of the flood control system. Basically, the Army Corps of Engineers has um, hey, noticed just that on that storm. How close was it? A foot? Uh, a couple feet below the. It was about a foot below the arches. Yeah, and the we believe that had it hit the arch, another foot, that would have slowed the whole thing down and would have quickly surged over the. <clears throat> uh, 
the Army has noticed, um, I suspect this all goes back to uh, Katrina. They have, uh, they're getting, trying to get a little more on their game to make sure that these flood control systems are up to snuff. Uh, they want us to do a fair amount of analysis, look at the, uh, the footings of the dikes, are they stable? Are, are, would they meet reasonable seismic requirements these days? Um, were the assumptions that were made 70 years ago sufficient? Does it still make sense? Are they high enough? Could they deal with what we now realize is a potential storm? Um, on the Mill River side, they want a similar analysis. Uh, there isn't as much happening over on that side. They've given us some deadlines. They want us to get busy on the Mill River system right away, and I believe that's in progress, at least for the preliminary engineering. This is still yet to be even started. Clearly, we're gonna, these deadlines are going to slip. Um, our impression from the Army is that if we're making steady progress, they're OK. Um, Terry, we have the, uh, the deadline for the Middle River system was recently um, bumped back by the Corps to be January 2014 to match the deadline for the Connecticut River. Uh -huh. And the other thing is that uh, the city um, the city had budgeted $250,000 for Mill River uh, levy repair work, which is something we're working on design in-house and trying to get that out to bid now. So not all the levy, won't cover all the levy work, but it's a portion of the. Okay. Um, estimate about over a million dollars for the engineering, the 250000 as a down payment on of the $1.2 million. Um, we think the engineering and the construction will run in that neighborhood. Uh, it will almost certainly identify deficiencies, which is going to add even more to that bill. The, the, pumps, the pump station is, has potential to be extremely expensive. We think just dealing with what they call the trash rack. This is a grate that comes down at the point where the pumps are turned on to keep tires and junk from being sucked up into the pumps. Just doing that might use up the entire million dollars, and that's one of the things they mentioned that they wanted to deal with. At the moment, we're planning to run an engineering study of all the various deficiencies of the pump station that they want us to deal with. Frankly, our fear is that once we touch that building, uh, it will be required that we meet current electrical standards, seismic standards, ventilation standards. Um, this is a touchy question. We have no idea where this is going to lead. What are the, what's the quality of those estimates? I come from an environment in which when somebody gives an estimate, they're required to say plus or minus so and so. I have to defer to Jim. You're not allowed to give a number. You have to give a range because okay. unless you've done really detailed uh, analysis, there's a considerable uh, slop in numbers. Well, the quarter of a million dollars that the city council is appropriate. No, no, I'm talking about these numbers. numbers. Just these yeah. numbers here. These are a 1.2 and 1.0. Now, is it plus or minus 100,000 or half a million? Jim? I would say that they're order of magnitude planning level numbers. Um, engineering hasn't been done and, and entirely scoped. Um, the improvements for the levy system, the design isn't done. Um, so it's, uh, you know, some preliminary level estimates that we've done in-house. There, there are a lot of unknowns in regard to the levy because some of the improvements for the levy systems, we won't know what they are until the engineering analysis is done. And the engineering analysis won't be done until there's the money to pay for that detailed study. So the things that we can quantify we do have backup for some of these numbers, which we can provide. Um, the things that we can identify on, to some level of detail, we've done um, reasonable cost estimates, and then other things are just order of magnitude for the purposes of conversation for this, which is these, these things cost a lot of money. We need, to find a, we need to find a source of funding for it. I don't know if that helps at all, but. No, I'm, I'm still, you know, when somebody says order of magnitude, that that's not a very helpful number to me because I still don't know how much more or less than that 
if I build a house, uh, I can make a guess that it's going to come within, say, 10 or 20 percent of the house. I mean, that's a reasonable estimate. If I just do it on the back of the envelope, which I might do, then it might be twice that amount. That's what I'm trying to wrestle with here is the, you know, I mean, are these potentially massively underestimated, and that's 2.4 or max 3. It, it, that's, that is a possibility. I think these also say minimal and could begin in the million dollar range. So I think I think the answer to the question is that the minimum is that these are the minimum. So that's even more suspect. This is the floor. What's the ceiling? Is it one to five million? Is that what you're looking Hope for? Hope for the best and plan for the worst. The, the planning ought to plan for the worst number and not present an optimistic number. I mean, that's, you're going to get into trouble. Well, just to go back to the, the charge, I mean, the dollar amounts really aren't, they're relevant in the big picture, but not for what we're trying to do. If it's two million or 20 million, we still need to come up with some formula that is fair and equitable. And whatever the dollar amount is, is what it's going to be. And we're going to get all of those numbers at some point. But we can do our work, I think, without even knowing what the numbers are. If you don't know how much you've got to raise, then the fee structure you might design could be, in, could be totally dependent on the amount you're trying to raise. Those two are related. You can't, if you take them apart, you run the risk of, of it comes in way higher than you think. The fee structure could be way out of whack. I mean, when you get a mortgage on your house, you know, you have an amount, and that's how you figure out your payments. So it is with the fee structure. That's just simply payments on what you're going to do. It's the same logic. Uh, I, I, I can understand we don't know, but I think it's something that we, we really... Okay. And I think you're and both the, right. The, yeah. the top. Yeah. Number one, whatever the fee structure is, that's what our charge is to determine. But we also need the city council and most of the BPW, DPW to say how much money they plan to raise in the first five years. Just to give us some rough number of whether the numbers are three million or twelve million. I don't because we in in order to sell it politically, that's what has to happen. But the fee structure doesn't make any difference. It has to be equitable, fair, and transparent. And then if it's two million, fine, and if it's twenty two million, not so fine. But the fee structure has to be equitable, fair, and transparent, in my opinion. So I agree we need to know what the big number is going to likely to be, but not to not to make a recommendation to the city council about how it should be charged for generating some more money. I think uh, the, I think Dan raises a very good point, and if you if you set up uh, an enterprise fund type of system, you'll you'll see that as time goes on, budgets for every year are determined, and Terry's going to go through some numbers a little bit later. We've where we've determined the first couple of years what we think a budget might look like, and we've got good numbers for those. As you go out, and I think Terry's also going to talk about this, he talked about the pump station at Hockenham Road a little bit. It's a very large project. There may be some projects that come up that may impact what the budget's going to be in any certain year. Um, so we've, we have what we feel are reasonable estimates to, to give you a sense of what the type of revenue requirement would be for an enterprise like this. And I think it's suitable for discussion in terms of equity, who pays what percentage, how does that work, and I think it would you know, a law for a pretty reasonable let's conversation. Just along, but let's not get on that line. Let me just say one more thing. Most of you have probably never been in the flight control station. And that building is a masterpiece of 1930s engineering and construction. If you ever have a chance to go in it, you should do that because it really is a truly astounding building which has been maintained by our dedicated DPW employees for low these 70. more drainage. So, so first of all, was that too much detail, not enough? That's the dikes, the pump. Uh, in terms of stormwater drainage, once you uh, put curbs on the sides of the street, every time there's some rain or some melting snow, you get a little lake. If it's the winter, you get an ice skating rink. Uh, we need to keep those roadways clear of water and ice for pedestrian and vehicle safety. Uh, the drainage system prevents localized flooding. Uh, we have some pictures here to give you examples of what that might look like. 
uh, minimizes erosion and protects the infrastructure. <laughs> Just the arrow, yeah. It doesn't arrow down. The pipe is plugged. It's <laughs> frozen. <laughs> So this has happened before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so disconnect the uh, gizmo there. So I'm assuming, Terry, this is a gear you brought with you. It is. <laughs> it say that. Okay. All right. So we've shifted now. We're talking about stormwater drainage. Um, again, the map of Northampton. The next one. Okay. So we've got about 100 miles of pipe all around the city that's moving water that's collected on streets to little brooks and streams and wetlands and rivers all around the city. We're, we're, taking, we're collecting water in a place where we don't want it to be, and we're getting rid of it somewhere where we don't care so much. Uh, next one. Just to be clear, I just wanted to, each, each 100 feet of this 100 miles is a lot of work, a lot of labor, a lot of money went into putting these pipes in the ground. We have almost 5,000 catch basins, the little grates along the curves, uh, where the water flows down into those pipes. They're all over the city. Um, this is a shared expense. There are people in some parts of the city who say, well, I don't have, uh, there's no drainage on my street. Well, it's almost everywhere. Uh, these are the outfalls. We have hundreds of locations around the city where, as I say, we've collected the water and now we're getting rid of it into a wetland, a stream, a brook. That's why the EPA is involved in this. The EPA is interested in the fact that we're taking our salty, sandy water from the streets and we're dumping it into waterways that we want to keep clean. Right? System is over 100 years old. Well, there are Places, I, I haven't crawled down to see them, but I'm told there are places where it's a timber floor with bricks in an arch, um, and they're still working pretty well. Excuse me. Um, just, just for reference, on those 5,000 storm uh, catch basins, what would you say the, the lifespan of those are? I mean, not the lifespan of them, but the age of them. 5,000, you know, 500 of them are 100 years old, just to get an idea of the age of the system. I mean, you talk about being 100, but I know at Smith we always struggle with the infrastructure creating right. these renewal plans. Our infrastructure is, you know, 70 years old, and the life expectancy is 40, so we're right. 30 years past the life expectancy, so we're on borrowed time. So when I see 5,000 structures, are they 10 years old, 20 years old, or are they more like the 50, 60, 70 years old? I was going to say that, uh, actually, we don't know the actual answer to that, but okay. uh, we have a lot of old... A lot of the drain systems in, in, in the city are, are clay pipe. Okay. So sort of turn of the century, early 20th century. So a lot of it is sort of that vintage. And then obviously newer development in town as that came through 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It's it's more upgraded, <coughs> but maybe, I don't know, half of the city maybe is could be turn of the century. Well, absolutely. Pipe. Yeah. The core of the city is the yeah. oldest. Because when you look at your replacement and the cost per foot, it's oh. huge. Yeah. We, well, was the we first think approximation say it's 50 years old, right? Well, that'd be a new subdivision. Yeah, that's a new one. Well, sure, you got some new and you yeah. got some very old, and if you just average it, 50 years is a reasonable guess. So well, the thing about it is your, your lifespan of these facilities are usually in the 60 to 80 year range. So you look at some of these facilities that are 100, 110, 20 years old, they well serve their useful life versus mm -hmm let's say the Rhino subdivisions that were done in the mid-50s to early 70s, uh, we don't currently have some issues with them, but 
they're coming to end their useful life also at 50, 60 years old. Uh, systems under capacity in many areas. Um, we have some pictures of it give you, you know, as soon as you see the pictures, you'll say, oh yeah, I know that. Um, <laughs> and uh, there just have been, there's been very little money for working on this. Uh, some years our available money for upgrading and working on this infrastructure is zero. Uh, it's just zeroed out as part of the process of putting together the, the next annual budget for the city. Uh, right in front of this building. Oh uh, no, that's, that's not true. It's just down the street there. Right? Uh, across from Dunkin' Donuts, under the railroad bridge there, we've all seen this lake. The system's under capacity there. Uh, we asked in a recent study, we gave the engineers four problem areas that we, we all know about here in the city. We said, just ballpark, what would it cost if we wanted to eliminate that problem. Uh, and they came back with an answer in the range of $19 million. Um, it's unlikely, unlikely we'll ever fix this problem, or certainly not in our lifetimes. Uh, but it was interesting, just to, it was a staggering number. Were those four areas? No, one. One. just this one. one. Okay. This one, great. Because the problem <laughs> is the whole drainage system is undersized, moving down Market yeah. Street. Um, go ahead. Uh, proper drainage prevents erosion. This is up on Hatfield Street. Uh, this is a gas line, and there was a, there's another high-pressure gas line moving through that area. Um, this is a watershed that's kind of up behind the Lathrop community that's draining down in this direction, down toward um, the line, sort of in that direction. Over collapse, keep going. On the street. Um, these are important systems. They're expensive systems. They're, they're in some cases we're living on borrowed time. Uh, this is uh, what Alex was referring to <laughs> earlier. Um, this this brook that comes down here, goes through the uh, Board of Public Works yard, that state yard that's down below the Board of Department of Public Works, through the Smith uh, Volk fields there. But you know, you have to say, and actually I think I put this slide in later, the hospital is up here, all of those parking lots and buildings. Um, the hospital put in retention ponds, to their credit, they've done a lot to slow down the water sheeting down the hill. But it all comes down sooner or later. It just takes a little longer with the retention models. That's a uh, that's pre uh, pre hospital project. We haven't seen an event like that. That's after. That is after. Okay. Yeah. I don't get called till that night. So I'm just yeah. <laughs> you, you must be in a counselor, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this is current. This is not a historical. This was in the past year or two. Yeah. It works. Yeah. Standing on the. Uh, this is um, one of those uh, developments from the 50 years ago, a uh, drainage gone awry. So as I say, the fact that we're collecting water and dumping it into brooks and streams brings us under the purview of the EPA. Um, we have a permit that allows us to do that, and they're about to update that permit. Uh, they gave us a draft of the permit oh, nine months ago, a year ago maybe, and there's quite a bit of pushback. They, it was fairly onerous, the sort of uh, things that the EPA was going to require us to do moving forward. Um, and so they've gone into a second round of draft proposals. We don't have one yet, but Doug has studied the one that uh, has become available in New Hampshire. Um, We'll go into it in a few moments, but basically it's going to dramatically increase our expenses for maintaining our infrastructure. In ways that have little to do with the actual maintenance of the infrastructure. 
Correct. That created yeah. testing and other kind of requirements, but it, it, it's not about fixing the pipes. No, it's, this is an example. Here's, <clears throat> so um, we go around on a regular basis, fairly regular, take the, cup, the cover off of a manhole and we pick up the muck that has accumulated down in these uh, catch basins. Uh, in a year, we don't get to all of them. We have almost 5,000. Uh, if you, I, I did the math just for the heck of it. If you um, did it 40 hours a week for eight months of the year, you'd have to take the cover off and do one of these every 14 minutes or so. Um, it, it's just not, it's not gonna happen, can't happen. So what they want us to do now is they want us to clean them whenever the muck at the bottom of the catch basin reaches 50% of the way up to the pipe where the water exits the catch basin. So the pipe is not all the way down, it's up to two or three feet, sometimes more. And there, so they want us to measure the muck down below, and if it happens to be over 50%, they now want us to report that to the EPA. Um, the question is, does it make any sense to send a truck, have them go there, lift the, the cover off, and probe and try to figure that out, or does it make more sense to just suck it up as long as they're there? Uh, next slide. <clears throat> this is the old way, this is a newer way. This is, these are amazing trucks. Uh, it just slurps up the muck on the bottom of the catch basin. Uh, they want us to clean the streets. Originally, it looked like they were gonna ask us to sweep, sweep the streets twice a year. Um, in the New Hampshire draft, it looks like they've backed off to once a year. Again, in the winter, this time of year, the salt, the sand, all the accumulated trash and debris on the streets in a rainstorm sweeps down the catch basin and off into a brook or stream or wetland. They want to minimize what's what we're getting rid of that way. That's what the street sweeping is for. They want to start sampling the outfalls, approximately 100 per year for the first three years. They want us to have gone through all of our outfalls by the end of three years um, in wet and dry conditions. They want us to test the water. Is there coliform in the water? Is there, are, what, are, what are the level of nitrates in the water? I think they're just interested in learning more about what we have. If there is coliform, we're supposed to report that. Um, investigation. You know, this is, as Bob correctly pointed out, none of this has anything to do with maintenance, which is a, an expense all of its own. Uh, they want us to develop some green areas where the water can soak back into the soil instead of running off into a storm drain. This is in front of the Gazette. Uh, public education is part of it. Um, look for illicit discharge detection, nitrogen reduction. Uh, they, we have a program looking at the municipal drains around the city and the municipal buildings. These are all little small pieces of the uh, permit. Moving on to a new portion of stormwater, the river and brook erosion. Um, again, there's no funding source for this. It's not covered by wastewater, by drinking water, by anything. It's coming out of the general fund at the moment. Uh, this, it's a little hard to see, this looks like a, a, a boulder almost, but actually it's a, you're looking through. This is out by the sanitarium on River Road, out past the um, chart pack. Um, the wall is collapsing here along that river. Uh, <coughs> underneath this street is the sewer line coming from the town of Williamsburg, coming into Northampton for our wastewater treatment plant. Um, and we've got, there's some other important infrastructure there, isn't there? No? So just that. But uh, it's, this is becoming a problem uh, that has to be dealt with. Um, this is below Musanti Beach, I think, right? You can see the house here, and, and that homeowner is concerned about the way this is headed. Um, this is a problem with no, no, no obvious source of funding. 
So all together, we've got the Army Corps of Engineers mandating studies um, and uh, remediation. We've got the EPA stormwater permit. Um, at the moment, we're thinking in the range of $400,000 a year to do all of the things they want us to do. Uh, and the river and brook erosion repair projects. So, describe the system, laid out the financial imperatives. Um, just for a quick moment, what if we say, hey, we don't have this money. We, we can't afford this. It's just, come on. You know, blood from a stone, all that stuff. Um, what, what can they possibly say to us? Uh, the EPA has in their regulations a section called failure to comply. And, and basically, our option with the EPA, if we don't want to face fines, is to either stop discharging the water or to comply. They're, they're not terribly interested in any alternative to that. We either comply or we don't discharge the water. Um, they're liberal with their fines. If we have a little discharge... You mean they charge big fines? They're, Correct. They're eye-popping. Exactly. That's what, what they're ruling. Yeah. The Army Corps of Engineers, I think we have a little more wiggle room with, um, but still they want it done. Basically, a levy system is either uh, in acceptable condition, it's marginally acceptable, which is what we have, or the third category is um, called um, inadequate. If they determine that we're just simply not um, getting the job done with our levy system, it would be reclassified as inactive. At that point, at some subsequent date, um, FEMA would redraw the flood zone maps as if the lead system were there. In which case, the flood zone would include that big lake on Conn Street, Pleasant Street, and the neighborhoods moving over, over toward uh, the fairgrounds. Uh, I talked to my banker about that and asked what, what would happen. And of course, this would be big news locally, so the banks would be well aware. At that point, all of those mortgages would be non-compliant because they're in a flood zone without flood insurance. It would, it would create havoc in the real estate market in those areas and for those homeowners. So my take on this is that we need to comply with the EPA and we need to show steady progress with the Army Corps of Engineers. I don't think they're going to beat us up if the 2013 deadline slips to 14 and the 14 moves to 15. We're working on establishing a way to pay for this stuff. We've started the studies. We're showing good faith, making good faith progress. Uh, but progress is the operative word, I think. Um, so, Doug, I believe you can close this file, escape and quit, or escape and close. Describe the system, um, talked a little bit about the mandates, where they came from. Uh, slideshow. Yes. The last piece of what I was going to talk to you about today is what we see coming up. Now, these uh, we have handouts of this, so you all get a copy of this. I can't see them. None of us can see him, Fred. Um, <laughs> it's hard to see. Um, can you blow it up? Let me just ballpark it for you. And, and uh, we have hard copies for everybody. Um, basically, this is FY13, last year. This is what we really spent last year. Uh, we spent about $200,000, a little over $200,000 on uh, storm drains and flood control. It included things like over time when there was a, a big event that necessitated turning on those pumps. You know, sometimes it's in the middle of the night. It's at awkward times always when there's a big storm. Um, so about $200 were spent on storm drains and flood control. We put in new drains where we're rebuilding North Street. Uh, that was about $219,000 for those storm drains. Uh, and we have about $99,000, $100,000 in bond payments on past projects. Projects going back to uh, 
the early 2000s. So that's $600,000. Yeah, 538. So that's what we spent last year. The total is what? 556? 538. Okay. $538,000. Uh, next. All right, this is 14. That's this year. This is what we're spending right now. Uh, 335 because we're not spending anything comparable to what we spent on North Street last year, this year. So you take out that $219,000 and Three thirty-five is what we're spending right now. This year, we're three quarters of the way through the year. We're getting a rebate. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a million bucks, give or take. Yeah. Uh, the two nineteen is, uh, is we think it's going to be about two twenty-one for stormwater and flood control. Uh, we're not spending anything comparable to North Street this year. The twenty thousand dollars here is for manholes, you know, rebuilding a manhole that shifts or settles, that sort of thing. Um, and we've got the, the $100,000 on bond payments has dropped to 94000 Okay. Now we're getting into projections. Um, flood control storm drain um, is going to go up because of the flood control mandates. Uh, it's going from 221 to 456. Jim will be available to, to parse those numbers more finely if anyone has any specific questions once they get the hard copies and kind of go through a question about this number or that number. You might as well pass them out if people wouldn't mind. This block here, nothing, nothing last year, nothing this year. The $436,000 is once the permit kicks in. It's our estimate based on the New Hampshire draft. It's the most current number we have. It's the most current mandate that we have, and the staff has turned that into an amount. What would it cost to do the uh, catch phases, to do the street sweeping, to do the... Chris? Um, You've you now mentioned the New Hampshire draft a couple of times. Can you or Doug speak to how we feel that it's relevant to Northampton? Do we, what do we know about the New Hampshire draft as far as the community that it's, it's related to and how, you know, how it looks like Northampton? Is, is it a good measure of what we're talking about? Sorry. The word is it's going to be close, but there's going to be some differences. And we don't know what those are until it comes. We had a draft for the whole state of New Hampshire. It's for the, it used to be split into three different permits, and they're putting it all together. But it's not for any one particular location. No, that's what I'm trying no, to get it's, it's for the whole, state. Right. Okay. So right. you would think we'd be similar. Yes. Okay. There, there's some differences in terms of the water quality goals in okay. Massachusetts compared to New Hampshire, so that may drive. But not. Some. That's great. Thanks, so. it, Al. It's the best uh, barometer. It's the best crystal ball we have uh, for anticipating what this permit is going to require us to do. It's the most current version that we can find. Um, and it looks like the number is in the neighborhood of $400,000 to comply with all the particulars of the EPA permit. That is $400,000 of new expenses. Um, there are some assumptions made in here which, you know, are certainly worth discussion at some point. I, I, I'm not sure that coming up with a formula for paying all of this um, is the right place to be having that discussion. But for example, there's an assumption in here that we would buy uh, one of, another one of those Vactor trucks that slurps up the muck at the bottom of it. Um, now that's debatable. Uh, it's an expensive vehicle. It's several hundred thousand dollars. 300000 So, you know, maybe we can't afford that right away. Maybe we can. So there are assumptions in this $400,000 plus thousand dollars. Um, but the numbers all make sense, I'm told, you know, based on the engineering staff. Um, we have taken, all right, well, let me work my way down. Under investments, we have plugged in a round number of $500,000. We're proposing that there be a number set aside each year for as yet to be determined projects. 
Um, once that is in here, then you can start to negotiate. For example, we need to spend $200,000 to do an engineering study on the pump station. That money is, um, has yet to be found. That study on the pump station has yet to be initiated. Am I correct? Yeah. So this, this is money. We have no idea where it's going to come from. And this is a project that has not started. It's one that we think we, we will need to start in a year, next year. Um, now maybe that should come out of the 500. Maybe we spend 200 and we have 300 left. I mean, there are pieces of this that are, you know, you, you can go like this to make them all work. Uh, down here, the uh, levy improvements. Um, Some of the projects that the Army is suggesting we do, telling us to do, maybe we borrow that money, or maybe we use this $500,000 and accumulate it for a couple of years and tackle, pay cash for one of these projects. I mean, there's, I, I sympathize with Jim when he says that, in, in a way, it's, We may never have perfect clarity on the numbers. The scope of what we need to come up with is in the range of a million and a half to two million dollars a year. This is just the expense budget. Yeah. And in some way, there's a capital. Well, we're we're suggesting that this five hundred thousand would be a a starting number for capital well, expenses. Well, that's the service on the debt. No. Oh. But no, this is available cash. 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 So. On, on, if I can speak to this just for a second. Sure. So at the bottom of this table, um, where it says debt service, those are those are projects that are bonded, and the debt service payments are for the projects that are listed. The projects that are bonded are on the flip side of the page that I handed out. Now the number that Terry's pointing at, the $500,000 number under infrastructure investments, would be a cash number that would be paid to do capital projects. So the difference is capital project cash, Capital project on the bottom would be a debt service number for the projects that are described on the back. So it would be a combination. And what Terry's describing is, is the way all the enterprise funds work and how he makes decisions as the board chair, which is do we pay cash for a project of a certain size or is it something that you want to pay a bond uh, interest payment on? Um, depending on the size, you can make that decision every year depending on how much money you have in the budget. So there's a, like he's saying, there's a little bit of negotiation there. You can evaluate each project. Project like North Street, that's 200000 If you have enough cash in the bank, you can cash for it. If you didn't, you might wait and you bond it or something else. So there's a number of decisions each year as you move forward in terms of how you, you might approach um, any given capital project. Bonding a project is seductively effective. Um, but the next thing you know, we are in a position where we're paying a billion dollars a year in interest across our enterprise funds. You know, For my clarity, our this task force, is, does the task force have input on how the money is spent, or we're we just here to decide where we're going to fund it? The latter. So do I understand correctly, Jim, that the proposal that's on the back of this shows four projects that you believe need to be done with reasonable estimates of their cost. That's correct. So there'd be three million dollars to take care of these four projects, which could be paid in part by the $500,000 annual improvement line? It could be. They're shown as a bonded cost in the bottom of the table, but there's different ways to do it. Yeah. And, and it's worth, I, I would like to point out a couple of things. The uh, River Road retaining wall and the Roberts Meadow Brook Channel, uh, those are two projects which FEMA has told us they will repay 75% of that expense. We don't have that, can't take it to the bank yet. That's correct. It's verbal. No. Not verbal. Now, NEMA's approved it for funding to FEMA. It's under FEMA review right now to make it a project. Gotcha. But we still have to pay cash to the contractor. It's a reimbursable, so we still have to pay for it. Right. They don't pay part of our bill, they reimburse us. So I hope I haven't muddied the So water. just so I'm clear about what we're looking at on the front page, for the four things at the bottom, the Levy Capital Improvement, River Penny Wall, Robert Brook Meadow, and uh, levy certification, 
the total cost of those things is round number $300,000. That's correct. Okay. So, so if that's the route we took, and how long would that bond be for? Yeah. So the so the three hundred thousand a year would be going a long way out. Okay. Or in theory, you could take the five hundred thousand and save it up for six years and just pay cash. I mean, that's okay. the balancing act that we're facing every year with it, the enterprise funds. What's the best way to do it? How much money can we conceivably uh, put aside for a big project? Yeah, but these are not all the projects that need to be covered, correct? Unfortunately, no. Okay, because even in your thing, you showed Austin Circle, which is not listed on here at all, Right. which is my neighborhood. Yeah. Sorry, can you talk a little bit more about the Camp Fair, some of the key budget was for the other projects than these four? Well, as I said earlier, we, we gave them four chronic problem areas in the city and asked them to uh, just give us preliminary numbers on what might that cost to address these four areas. And the number was stunning. It was basically $20 million for each of those four problem areas. Um, it's just impossible to think how we could ever come up with that kind of money. You, you've got a copy of the report with you, didn't you? Do you? <laughs> this, was, this, was the one, this was the one that came out back in like uh, about a year ago, and it, it quoted a figure of $100 million that would result in an annual payment into an enterprise fund, which was the recommendation that the consultant made um, about how to finance these things. Uh, payments, an annual payment of about, what, $65? Yeah, so this got a lot of coverage, and I was actually getting phone calls about, what's this new $65 tax I'm going to have to pay? Um, but what they did was they stacked a bunch of things that were required, and, and then also things that were, that as Terry said, we sort of tasked them to look at. So this $100 million number, which sort of took on a life of its own, was in many ways kind of, not even a wish list, it was sort of a, it was sort of a study about what, what we were looking at getting into as we move forward on this. Did that report also not project the 15 to $20 million cost for the flood control station? It did. Yeah. That's a far different number than what we're talking about here. I'm not saying we should or shouldn't do it. I just yeah. want people to have a real sense of how big these numbers could be. I think that the, the CM report identified the four big problem, sort of problem areas that were identified in the study. Those aren't priority projects for the city, in our opinion, at, at Public Works. I think the priority projects, we would look at street projects like North Street, and looking at projects of the mag magnitude that could be accomplished using that sort of $500,000 annual number that Terry has identified there. That's a number that's comparable to water line replacement in terms of what we do there and sewer line replacement. So that's comparable to what we do for other pipeline replacement jobs within, within the city using the other enterprise funds. The one big project is the pump station project that you mentioned, Bob, and that, um, you know, CDM had a number in there, it was on the 15 to $20 million order. That project is probably a few years away. Terry mentioned there's a $200,000 study in there to determine how do we fix this or rebuild it or replace it or, you know, how do we meet the future needs of the city. But we have a, you know, it's a Smithsonian Institute artifact down there, and you know, we really need to do something to upgrade that. And I don't mean to sound the alarm here and say that the EPA is going to go out and spend $100 million on all these things at all. But it's important that we be aware of the things that need to be addressed in the city as in the next 10 years. If, if I understand our charge correctly, if we're not to be doing budgets and that's deciding correct. line items on budgets. No, that's a lot of fun. Uh, that's on our charge. If I understand the charge, it's what kind of a fee structure can we reasonably expect the residents and the businesses in this community to pay to handle this. And how would we structure the fees? Would they if you pay a dollar a day or would you pay it on a basis of how big your yard is or how many trucks you park in your garage that's or exactly right. whatever yeah. the case might yeah. be. But that's our charge. I'm not sure that well, you we're saying is that the ballpark is a couple million bucks. Right, but but I would be happier to see uh, 
instead of numbers like 5387592, I think 600,000 is probably enough for us to know about, and the rest of it isn't very helpful. And it's 3, 335,350, not very helpful either. That's $300,000. I those, think that's if what we Dan don't, was saying. Too. If we don't get a sense of the, yeah. Yeah. is this an elephant we're trying to eat or a, or a turkey? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we won't be able to design a fee structure. It's just like buying a house, you know. You, buy a big house and the mortgage payments are so much. If you buy a little one, they're different. And that's really what it comes to. That's right. So getting a handle on the how big this thing is is really if we do that to the politicians. Uh, <laughs> we would be very happy to just agree it's around two million dollars a year. And and if and that's the number to work with, I mean I I mean, I might question it, but if somebody says, Paul Spector says, it's the number you need to figure out how to go get people to put in a collection plate every week so that we pay for this, then we'll go decide how big the collection plate is or how many pennies people have to pitch in or, or whatever. Alex had a question. No, that was my question. I just I wanted to make sure that, that I understood that, but that's the target. You guys have been talking about it for a year. Two million is something that you'd... Can you talk a little bit more about how big the city's other enterprise funds are by comparison? Uh, water is about six, seven, seven, and sewer is three, almost four. Okay. Is this issue? Do, do we know other communities? Are we in worse shape or better shape, or is this what we're looking? What other communities you're looking at? Well, let me get a little further. Okay. Right? And, and then to that, are there a task force and other? Communities or, or have been started and have some a startup knowledge that we might not have. You know, I swear to you, I think that the, I have several communities yeah. I have articles the on. They do a much better job. You know, if, if Duckworth or somewhere mm -hmm. has a great idea, I wish they would have a better sure. way of spreading that information right. around. Oh. You blew it up so we can <laughs> read that small print. <laughs> Those are some bad eyes. All right, so all right, so two million a year. Let's just for the moment think of that. Right now, we're using the general fund to pay those. Um, we put overrides in here simply because when we talk to people about this, it often comes up as an idea. How about overrides? Uh, we could create some kind of a stormwater flood control fee, perhaps an enterprise system, or maybe some combination. For example, I believe Westfield uses some money from the general fund, and then they have a fee structure as well. Uh, general fund, all right, so that's the existing source of doing this. These programs then are competing with police, fire, schools. Um, as these numbers move forward and get larger and larger, it's just hard to imagine some of the conversations you might have. Uh, <clears throat> we need to replace one of the engines on the pump station. We're going to lay out four firemen and three teachers. And these are just conversations I don't think anyone would ever want to be having. Um, the funding may not be stable or adequate. Uh, as you know, we're rebuilding North Street from the end of market up toward the industrial park. Uh, that project got put on hold at least one year, and I think maybe two years, because the city didn't have enough money to pay for the storm drains. The water enterprise fund was ready to go. Uh, the sewer enterprise fund was ready to go. We had the money to do the paving work. But that $216,000 we mentioned earlier for the storm drains wasn't available. <clears throat> just, by, just to give you some perspective on this, that's approximately 4,000 feet of storm drain that we put in. And if we kept going at that torrid pace every year, 4,000 feet, 4,000 feet, 4,000 feet, it'd be about 130 years before we get around to North Street again. Um, as expensive as that project was, as nice as it's going to be to get it done, it's not even keeping up with the need. Um, the funding's not equitable, I would argue, if you're looking at the tax rate as a way to pay for it. A house on Ward Avenue up on Round Hill Road might be worth 
easily three times the value of a house down in Bay State. Uh, or let's say Ward, so Ward Ave drains down toward the Mill River, parts of Bay State, you know, but the Ward Avenue house is much more expensive. It may not be any larger. It certainly probably doesn't generate any more runoff. And yet, using the general fund, it would be paying three times as much as its contribution, as that house of property's contribution to stormwater. And um, nonprofit institutions do not contribute. Um, about 25% of the area in Northampton is tax exempt. And thinking back on this, we've got the hospital here and Smith Folk. Uh, you know, it's a good question. Should the nonprofits contribute? They're certainly generating runoff. Should city properties contribute? Again, they're certainly generating, they're contributing to the runoff. The schools, the parking lots, it's all contributing. Uh, you know, that's the kind of tough question that this committee was formed for. How do you figure that out? Uh, general fund and an override, again, we put this in just because people ask about it. I think it's totally unworkable. Uh, the program funding needs will fluctuate from year to year, and we are told that an override can't go like that. You know, the override is for X amount of money, and if next year you need a little more, you have to have a little mini override, or you redo the override. Uh, they tell us it's just unworkable. Uh, or fee. Uh, Bill Dwight says, I can't be on the committee because everyone knows what I think. Uh, I think this is a, probably the most practical idea, but again, this is something that we're asking you people to review and de determine for yourselves. Um, it has potential, though, to be a dedicated, stable revenue source. Um, Tax-exempt properties would be included. It's a fee, like water, like sewer. Um, as you can see, it's been implemented all over the country. Locally, uh, Westfield, Chicopee, Springfield? Reading, uh, Newton, yeah. Fall River. Um, and all the cities and towns in Massachusetts face this same dilemma. Oh, yeah. Is that correct? So oh, it's goes there, though. Not the flood control, but the. But the stormwater. Storm. Okay. No. No? They're 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 yeah, if they're in a, in a metropolitan area, so we're in Springfield. Very rural community. They don't buy. Um, encouraged by DEP, EPA. Uh, it would require approval by the city council. Um, there would have to be some structure set up, like the water enterprise fund, for example, might be a way to do it, like the sewer enterprise fund. Before we move on, um, we can monitor. Um, for the purposes of setting fee structures, we can monitor water usage and sewer usage effectively. How would we determine who's generating what when it comes to, I think this is a question we're going to have to get to at some point, yep. is, is how do we monitor who's generating how much? Um, if it's going to be <laughs> sort of usage-based, usage is the wrong word, but, but source-based, um, fee structure, where there's some recognition that some people are worse polluters or runoffers or whatever they are well, some, <laughs> than some others. Of the, some of the slides coming up, we'll talk to that a little bit, and I think Jim has some thoughts. Well, Chris has a, a knack to, to getting to the heart of the matter, certainly. Um, I think one of the key things that the task force needs to consider is the answer to this question. And there are a variety of ways that the communities have dealt with this, and you may be having some slides in this regard, but part of it may be related to a previous area on, on a lot. Uh, so, pavement, building size, things that sort of generate runoff, obviously. And then um, another factor that you may want to consider is the gross area of the lot, because even if a lot isn't paved, you still have runoff coming out of your lawn, some of these issues. So, one of the things that the task force, uh, I think, should be considering is who gets a bill? Is it undeveloped lots, or just is it based on impervious, or a combination of both, or, or whatever? So, there's a couple of factors there that are sort of related to the amount of runoff. Um, of stormwater, and it seems like a, a reasonably uh, equitable way of determining what fee would be. 
part of the reason I'm asking this is because at some point in time I'm going to circle back to a, a, a concept that I've been sort of toying with, which is runoff remediation on site as a way to incentivize people to um, do do the right thing, a la what Cool and Dick did, um, and and how we might tweak a fee structure that acknowledges that you have done X, Y, or Z to reduce the burden on the system and figure out a way if that's applicable at the residential level. Clearly, it's applicable at the commercial level, but, you know, because at some point, we're going to ask people to pony up an awful lot of money in one way, shape, or form, and I think it would be nice to offer them an alternative where they can proactively say, I'm doing this, so give me $5 off this year. Um, and I know it's not the right structure, but I'm thinking about, like, you know, we sell at cost the rainwater things. If I can demonstrate that I own three or four of these, does it knock $2 off my annual fee? That kind of thing. Um, you're going to be hearing more from me on this one. Well, I think, it's a, I think it's really important if I could just speak to that. A lot of communities that set up these types of fee systems have a credit system that goes along with it. So the, to incentivize the activities that you're talking about that allows a modest reduction in the fee, and encourages behavior that um, that you want to you want to encourage. I think it's an important thing. And one of the aspects of the credit system is what do you allow a credit for? What's the maximum amount of deep you can allow in a bill? And I think those are policy decisions that would be great to talk about. Yeah. Have we ever talked to some of these communities that have done this? I mean, gone over to their town meeting or their officials and sat down and looked at them across the table like we're looking at people here. And There's only a few in the state. Well, I, I know, but have we have we actually talked to one? Let's make it simple. Should just be able to get their policies. So yeah. we can read their policies. Right. Yeah. That's part of what we're going to. You know, that's part of what I understand the, the. But I'm asking at this point in time, has anybody ever yeah. done that that we know of? I've read the Westfield I've, ordinance. Yeah, I've, I've, I've downloaded them all at home too. So you, yeah. we've actually yeah. talked to them. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Got some input on them. Yeah. Uh, <clears> did they get lynched or did something bad happen when they imposed something there? <laughs> Westfield pays a lot less than we're asking for anybody to pay. Right. A lot less. And Chickabee is under a consent decree really until 2026. Knowledgeable about the enterprise. They're not paying anything. Do you have sort of in layman's terms what would meet uh, the legal requirements that would stand up to a court challenge that's acceptable? What, you, what you've done is equitable. Is there enabling? Is there must be state enabling? Well, there's enabling legislation available for an enterprise fund. Um, I, the first, at first, as you stated your question, I was thinking you're asking do we have some unimpeachable method of assessing a fee? No. No, not unimpeachable, but a guidelines that are set up for, for enterprise funds. The structure of the enterprise fund is enabled by existing legislation. Right. It requires approval by the city council. Do you have a, a, do you have a synopsis of that? Do you have a, it's online. You can actually get it online. Type in Massachusetts Enterprise Fund. And there's a document about this that okay. describes enterprise funds and how they work, how they function, how they can be set up. Yeah. Not only does it have to be approved by the city council, then it has to be approved by the state. Um, I, I think the enabling legislation allows Okay. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay. I, I just know that. Okay. Don't call me. But you're right, Alex. We really we do need to know what the rules are about enterprise funds because we don't want to go down a right. So, but wrong road. To put this in perspective, for if you said you're going to spend two million dollars and you just ask the citizens in this city to pay for it, there are thirty thousand citizens, give or take. That's sixty-six bucks a head. Mm -hmm. If it's $20 million, it's $666 a head. So that, that gives you a sense of how much money is on the table. Uh, you know, well, $66 per person, a lot? Well, that would depend on who you were, of course. Right. And certainly That's everybody would recognize water is around you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know, but let's see, when the water is rising, $66 isn't as much as you <laughs> would <laughs> Uh, and then the, the fourth would be that hybrid I mentioned, such as Westfield has. Um, again, it relies on the general fund having enough money in a given year to participate in, in its share of the expenses. Uh, is there one more? I think it keeps going. Uh, 
uh, so this is just uh, this is from an earlier presentation. Basically, estimate estimate the revenue requirements, develop a rate structure. That's what you're here for. The billing system is probably fairly straightforward. It might piggyback on water and sewer bills. Fee structure options. All right, flat fee based on property value. I, I mentioned earlier why I think that is problematic based on property value. Gross area, I think, has a place in this. Impervious area probably does. Uh, there's a balance about residential versus commercial. I think uh, many communities have found it unworkable to try to get down to calculating how many square feet of driveway and roof there is on a typical residential property. At some point, it, it may make sense to just say, you know what, single and two-family houses, X amount of money, and then focus that that's detailed attention on larger commercial properties. Um, credits, as Chris mentioned. Uh, how do you handle agricultural land? Should it be handled differently than land that's been specifically set aside with agricultural restrictions? That sort of thing. Uh, the impervious area for large properties, stop and shop, car dealerships, that sort of thing, it, it, it's it's, it's not unattractive. It's, it, it, it makes sense. You know, it's like, okay, this is clear. I've got X number of square feet of pavement running off into the storm drains. Uh, that's a place where you could really talk about um, mitigation programs, mitigation features in getting a credit. It's easy to imagine how that might work. Many towns, as I said, use a flat fee for residential and then calculate uh, commercial. You know, it can be done with GIS maps. They can just figure it out. Um, we may have to pay a consultant to help us just for the sheer volume of it, but it's doable. Single family, you know, the split, how does the split work out? <clears throat> Are the single family houses paying roughly half? Commercial, larger properties paying half? Uh, these are tough questions. Uh, they really are. You'll, you'll earn your money on this. A combination may, it appeals to me, uh, you know, it, it seems equitable. All of the property owners have some square feet of property. Everyone participates on some level. Um, credits, these are the sort of credits that, uh, again, that you mentioned, Chris. Um, City property be built. I think that's it. Is that the last one? Yes, it is. Thank you very much for Thank your you. attention. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. You know, if I could say, I think that the fourth point, in the last slide, is the key point because the city of Northeast. Let's go back to the fourth point so we can all see what it is. Should city property be built? Because all of us, as citizens of Northampton, own. The roads, the city buildings, the parks, the sidewalks, and the parking lots. So the fact that our general fund pays for stormwater is one way it acknowledges that collective responsibility we have. So it seems to me that one thing that makes our task difficult, we need to figure out a way to figure out, and I don't know whether the city prop where the city owned property is 30% of impervious surface. 50% or some other number. I do not know what the actual number is. But I think we need to figure out a way to build all of us as residents for our collectively owned streets, sidewalks, parking lots, roads, and schools. And then to build individuals for your 2,000 square feet impervious services and Rick's 3,000 and Dave's 4,000 square feet. So that's going to be, I think we also need to figure out how to do credits like Chris talked about. Um, which should be retroactive in my opinion. But the first thing we have to figure out is how much of the city is city-owned property, how much of the impervious surface, the city of what percentage is city-owned property. And once we know that, then we can struggle with the question of do we want to bill ourselves for that amount, proportion of property taxes, or based on population, based on who knows what, we have to figure out a way to deal with that issue, and then we can deal with the runoff from 
Smith's parking lots uh, and Terry's, whatever it happens to be. But that's a separate question to me than what our collective responsibility is for our city-owned properties. So you're saying every person in Northampton should pay a portion of all the city-owned property? Yes. What about renters? We have no way to bill renters. It's going to be complicated because of the way the city's billing system works. So as a property owner, I have to pay a portion of, say, a Ryan Road School parking lot, but a renter doesn't have to pay. Well, their landlord parking. will have to pay, presumably, because every property owner, which is not the renters, I understand, would get billed for that 600000 I don't know what the number is, but for that piece of the city ownership, the stuff we all own together, we need to figure out a fair way to bill ourselves and we got to get it right in the beginning because once we set this up, it's never going to change. Well, i got to tell you, for most of the regular property owners, not the people who have financial means, but for myself and most of the people that I know in mm -hmm. Northampton, it's going to be tough enough just to pay this tax on our own properties. And I mean seriously hard. If we start adding in uh, streets and schools and all the other city-owned property and you start increasing this up and up and up, you're going to see a lot of people moving out of town. I don't see, I think that, I think that's a not a correct comparison because we've got to raise two million bucks. I don't care where it comes from. So if we all now pay $600,000 out of the general fund towards that, so what I'm asking is that everybody in the city pay their fair share of the city-owned stormwater generating. From the general fund. From the, I don't care where it comes from. Couldn't you? I don't think it should be the general fund for the reasons Terry spoke about. Yeah. But p uh, one piece of the formula has to be you, we each have responsibility for X square feet of city-owned impervious surface. Mm -hmm. so I we think pay for that. I think he's suggesting it would be a everyone would pay a flat fee to cover city impervious area, and then there'd be some incremental add-on based on the amount of your what lot is, size, the impervious on, area. On your own, for your own personal that. property. I also think there's a lot of other ways to go about well, this. I've done a lot of research. I mean, East Hampton, I realize grants are probably out the window now because of the federal surface, but East Hampton got a grant for this. Uh, Chicopee got a cap of 2% for theirs. Uh, West Hampton pays very, I think it's $20 is what I saw West Hampton paid, and their city is the same size as our city. Um, that was, that's just three of the research I've got, a stack of research at home for what cities are paying. Um, and different ways that they're paying. We are, um, it sounds just from what I'm hearing, like we're immediately saying right off the top of our heads, we're going to attach a fee. And nobody has mentioned any other ways to look at anything. And I don't, I mean, I, I agree that that's probably what we're going to have to do. But I think we should stop and think that there are other ways to approach this. Don't just dismiss everything without thinking about some other ways to do this too. I just want to get that That's in right. there before we just automatically go without thinking about anything else because I know there are other ways to and other things to look at. I agree with you, but I but I think that it's also about to come, I think, to a consensus that what it, what we need is new money. That there's there's no current there's no current stream of revenue. Yeah, I know grants are probably right now out of the window because of the federal yeah. situation. Yeah. I also know that today the school system started talking about a 2.5% yeah. rise, the general so that's... Fund is not, there's not, it's new revenue that's, that this means. Yeah. And with the school system going for an override, I think that's just out of the window, too. The other problem with grants is that it doesn't provide you with the, uh, the sort of steady and reliable stream of funds. I think it's great on a per project basis, um, but as you're looking at, um, you know, having having revenue available, a steady supply of revenue available over an extended period of time for a general program of, uh, of maintenance and, and, and investment, that you, you're not going to be able to rely all that much on grants, even 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 in a situation where if the, if the federal government was flush, and we know that that's you know. <laughs> you know I think it's telling that both. Well, the feds and the state governments are suggesting that communities evaluate things like utilities for this very reason. Yeah. There's no grant money, and the grant money is no way to run business. I, I'd just like to say that, you know, in the budget I see $20,000 for uh, 
education, and I, I think that's totally inadequate for what we what we're going to need to do. So uh, just picking that apart, I, I would really like to emphasize um, the education part of this and getting people aware of, of what, <clears throat> what we're in for, uh, because I think it is going to be a shock to a lot of people. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that we should examine, you know, creative ways to, to educate, you know, Northampton. I, mm. Are people going to see it as a tax? What's that? People are going to see it as a tax. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. they yeah. already do. Well, yeah. It, yeah. That's yeah. a different, edu I mean, that education is actually sort of the ongoing education about ways to reduce pollutant That's loading I mean. and stuff. And as far as catch bases. The education that we're going to need is, is actually going to, you know, I don't, it's not included in this <laughs> budget. Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of sort of this pre-education to get the acceptance. Yeah. The, the other thing is with the, uh, the larger um, payers of this fee, if that's where we end up, should be alerted as soon as we, you know, pay now. I, I think we shouldn't give them the opportunity to uh, um, you know, not be prepared for this since they'll be such big contributors. So the earlier we get yeah. in um, on I think, that. Uh, you mentioned 30,000 residents, but how many property owners? Oh, right. I, I, I just picked that, that right, number. Right, 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 right. 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 7,000, I think. 7,000, right. I was mm -hmm. going to use that. So the, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. number becomes $250. Right. So multiplied by $3. Right, but yeah. it doesn't take into account. That's all. That's just all. That's just yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. It went from sixty-five to two fifty. Yeah. Just right. to break it down. I just so, picked the number. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the magnitude is four times the initial uh, what, what you're referring yeah. to. Yeah. It's not sixty-five. It's two fifty, and that's just a minimum without figuring in the, the yeah. city part. So we're, we're talking. Uh, you know, I don't know if it was a, a fee. We're talking three hundred and fifty dollars, four hundred dollars. I don't know, five hundred dollars. It's not sixty dollars. Well, as, as, as interim chair, it's 20 minutes to 9. I sent everybody an email that we'd be done by 9 o'clock. Uh, I have a long history of running meetings on time. And so if we're going to do that, we have to do these other items that we talked about. Otherwise, we don't get out by 9. I'm leaving at 9. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm leaving at 9. So I think we need to go back now and decide if, if we're going to have a chair or we're going to have a rotating chair or we'll draw lots on each meeting to see who's going to be chair or just how we're going to do that. Uh, you seem very efficient, Emery. I, I would nominate you as chair if that's how we're going to, uh, to take care of this. We're not doing motions, but I would second it if we were doing motions. <laughs> I'd like to nominate Alex. Oh, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> right. Other it, ideas? It inhibits you from being a, a, a strong advocate. Are you unwilling to be fair on that? Uh, no, I'm then unwilling. I mean, it just it, you understand that uh, I have some really firm views on how to run a meeting, and I think that's uh, great. I'm, that's not, great. I'm, I'm not very tolerant of, of uh, <laughs> chit chat. So, uh, and, uh, yeah, nine o'clock works good. So, I have <laughs> that so, so you have the problem yeah. that I'm likely to cut people off, and yeah. and so you need to understand that's that's the way it'll happen. I don't want to delude you into thinking that. This is a kinder and gentler chairman you have. Uh, I would intend to run meetings on time, on the agenda. If it's not on the agenda, we're not going to talk about it. And then, if we, But if we want to put things on the agenda, we can just let you know. Well, sure. If you want to right. put an item on the agenda, that's fine. I, that's what we have agendas for. Right. Absolutely. Right. But, but we're not going to put agenda items on uh, just come walking through the door. Well, this is a good thing to talk about tonight. Because we'll be here till midnight, like the council is. <laughs> they don't. They don't manage their time, in my opinion, very well. <laughs> and if I'm being recorded, so be it. There's one thing, Emery, I'd like to add to the agenda every week. Can we add a uh, public speaking section? Yeah. I Could be. Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk about that. Under uh, best practices, we should do we should that. Under open transparency. Yeah. 
yeah. that fact get passed. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sure. And we talk about what we're going to have. Right. And then, so when we could, that that maybe comes under the, the discussion here of how we're going to operate the yeah. uh, okay. the committee. So I just wanted people to make be clear in their minds. If I'm chairman, we will run out of time. I'd like to make a motion that the nominations be closed. Second. Okay. You want a secret ballot? You want to vote by hand? <laughs> no, I say by acclamation. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't have any acclamations around here. Oh. Congratulations. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, very nicely done. Very quick. Great. Thank you very much. Well, as, as chair, now the question is, do you want a vice chair? Because there's always the beer truck problem. So I could get hit by a beer truck or any one of us around this table. We all go I was going to bring you to the chair. We go, we go. Well, that, that's your prerogative. That's your prerogative. I can't tell you how to do that. Chasing that beer truck. Chase down the truck. We'll chase the truck. Well, that, that might or might not be a good thing. Uh, but but it, is, it is an issue that if you want real continuity and something were to happen, if you have someone who can step in, uh, that's probably a good thing, but it's uh, it's uh, it's the committee's choice. Mr. Felton, you interested in being our vice chair? I I, mean, I think we can cross that bridge if we need to, but you're at the right end of the table. It's going to be Bob. You'd make a nice vice chair as well. So I nominated Dan. <laughs> Next meeting is yours. <laughs> I couldn't resist that. Uh, so I guess the question then becomes, how do you want to operate the committee? Uh, my view is that we should take minutes, but we should take very, very modest minutes. We don't need to record all the discussion. If we take votes, we have to record it. If we have a presentation by someone, that ought to be recorded. Maybe it's just a link to, to that talk or whatever. That's fine. But we don't. I don't think we need a long list of what we talk about uh, until we come to a recommendation. And then, of course, I think we need to record it. I agree with you in spirit. I don't think it's practical. I think that the issues we're going to deal with are substantial enough. We really want to have more detailed minutes other than just we met. We voted on this resolution, passed it, and adjourned. I think we do need to keep some detailed minutes because people on the council are going to want to know how we come up with these recommendations. And if we don't have some detail, I'm not saying we have to have every word down, but some kind of real minute-keeping process. That's part of best practices, and I really think we need to do the best job we can instead of being cursory. I, I, I agree. I, and part of the charge is that we follow best practices. And there... And, and Way committees should operate in the city are very clearly spelled out. Public comment is one of them. Uh, the way minutes are, it's going to be public to show the agenda early on. Uh, because in the end, uh, the effectiveness of the recommendation, the idea that you're going to get it past the council, which in effect is the vote of the city, is that this is yeah. that we represent uh, the wisdom of this community. That this is what broad section of people listened to all the facts, came up to this conclusion, and the weight that that has uh, with the city uh, will bear on whether it passes the council or not. It's better that the more open the process, the more clear and, uh, and, and you know, the kinds of outreach, the kinds of public, and the way we run our meetings are important. Well, I certainly have no uh, problem with people coming to the meeting and, and, and making commentary. If someone wants a specific thing to be recorded, I, my solution to that is if somebody asks us to write a, a point down, then we write it down. Or if somebody on this committee asks to have a specific point recorded, we record it. I don't think that's careful enough. I think we really have to get each thing down. Um, as the staff with a pen, um, public works, we're, we're willing to capture the spirit of discussions and present them in meetings for people to review. And I think 
try to capture the important points that people make during the course of the meeting. And, uh, we'll post them, we'll post them in the form. Yeah, and distribute them to people to review if something was missed. Be happy to add it. That'd be great. And we gotta post them. And we won't do it verbatim because I'm just that, we don't have a recording device, yeah. or, although we won't have what we I can always give you a copy of this recording too, Jim, if it'll help with doing the minutes. Are you going to, are you planning, Ruth, to, to, uh, to, vi to video each of the yeah. meetings? So, that's yeah. excellent. That's yeah, and I'll give you a copy, Jim. I can email it to you so you'll have it to help. Well, uh, in the company I worked for, we had a concept called pushback. And pushback was if somebody came up with something, you could push back. So I want to push back. I see little value in having a stack of discussion like this recorded for posterity. What I think is really important is to record essential points and a clear recommendation, and that that is more important than taking copious notes and posting them, because in the end, the recommendation is the thing that really counts. And, and I don't have any hesitation to have lots of discussion, but I, but I think this record keeping of everything that's said uh, takes a lot of time and a lot of work, and I would rather devote that resource, whether it's VPW or somebody else, to really important matters. And I think lots of record keeping is not necessarily really important. The spirit, I think, is really important, but beyond that, uh, there's going to be a lot of pushback from the community on this, and I, I think that to not have the details of what goes on and the thought process would be a huge mistake. Especially if Jim's willing to do that. Uh, so be it. I, I, I don't have a problem. I'm the chairman, and I'll take it. Can I, can I say something? I, I think I can clear this up a lot. The city has a set format for minutes that they've published. It's come out of city council and the mayor's office. It's a, a set format. It tells you exactly how much to put for each item. comes from your agenda. It's, it's very brief. They tell you exactly what to put for each item. It doesn't take long. It's only for a two-hour meeting, you wind up with maybe a page, maybe a page and a half at the most for your minutes. It's also a set format for your agenda. Um, tells you what to put on your agenda. It has set items that come out for the agendas. Agenda is very brief. Um, it, it comes, it, they give you exactly how to set up your agenda. So it's, you know, you really don't have a lot of discretion. You don't have to put a lot of um, filler in it. They tell you, especially if it's recorded, everything's all set. I'll get Jim a copy of all the instructions and, and how to do it. Makes it very easy to do. Takes Can a lot of the guesswork out of it. Website, uh, uh, is this going to be listed on the DPW's website as a as a, so is this a, a, a subcommittee of the DPW? Yeah, I think it would make sense if we did. Yeah. Because then you could put a link there right. that gave to the, the video, to the, to the video, video. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. a place where. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get you the address where the video is posted too. Yeah. That's it. So one thing that City Council does is they have a combination of not copious notes but uh, records of what was voted on, who voted yay, nay, and so on, and they supplement it with the video recording. Oh, Those I'm are the eight minutes mm -hmm. recording the video recordings. Mm -hmm. I don't ever hang up with that. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. It's really simple. But that means we need somebody here making the video recording every time. Which means you're going to do that. That's great. Yeah, okay. I'll be here every time. Okay. Let's talk for a minute about how much public input we want to get. We we have five minutes. That's why I'm bringing it up. So we're going to make nine o'clock. Right. So what do we think? I think before we come up with a once we come up with a formula or two, we should test it out on some sample properties and see what the costs really are going to be for individual properties. And one thing to be helpful to do that is to hear from anybody who's got opinions about what we should do at some point in the process. Because if we just do this like there's no public out there, we're going to get burned. And if I could just add on to what you were saying, um, not being a resident of Mass, not being a resident of Northampton, I kind of went off and looked for some you know, guidelines in, in coming up with ways that other communities, whether it be Maryland, North Carolina, or some other states that I lived in, dealt with this. And I, I found this, this guideline. Um, it was in 2006. It came from the EPA, uh, National Association of Flood and Stormwater. 
it was really helpful in what some of these, and I can get the link if it would be helpful. I'm right. Please. But it, it talked about you know cost per square foot. It talked about you know land size. Yeah. It talked about uh, impervious, you know, non-impervious, etc. And, and how they came up with the rates. And it talked about lawsuits. And it talked about you know, how you set up the funds and you know how you have to be cohesive yeah. and all these other things. I, I found it very rewarding to go through it. So, John, we have that document. We can put it on the website and send everybody the link. I think it'd be helpful for the group to see that because they talked about some, some things that were successful. And now that we know what the, the funding requirements are. And the group's question hasn't been answered about public comment here. How are we going to address public comment during our... We should have a public comment meeting at the beginning, here at the beginning of every meeting. It'll take more time, but we should have it. Should be on the is it appropriate to designate an amount of time for that? Three minutes yeah. each. Three minutes yeah. each. Okay. They have to state their name and their address, yeah. and then they're allowed three minutes to speak. So we're going to need to incorporate that amount of time. Is there, is there a cutoff? Of that's, what I, that's, what, that's really what I was asking. 20 yeah. people that can go, so the first 60 minutes is taken up. We're going to let anybody who shows up go. Is yeah. that what it is? Are we going to have a public forum at some point? I, would I mean, hope I'm so. assuming not very many people are going to show up to our individual meetings, but if we hold a forum, we yes, certainly should plan to do yeah, that at some that's point. That's yeah. a very good idea. Well, yeah. you know, I think that's something we're going to have to decide some of these details in another meeting. I don't think we're going to get that sorted out, yeah. which brings us to an interesting subject. When do you want to have the next meeting? Do you want to meet uh, every other day, or once a week, or once a month? Or <laughs> What's your pleasure? <laughs> We should not meet on the city council meeting once. Mm. Well, that's, that's probably yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Because we and won't we have, have access to city councilors, and they won't have access to us. And we have a short deadline, too, so I don't yeah. think we want to go once a month. Yeah. That's not. Once every two weeks. That sounds good to me. Uh, You've got to move this along, I think. Yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 I agree. I, I, I have the luxury that I'm retired, so I can. Uh, the time and, uh, you're saying you're flexible. They've said that September is really the, the deadline. So we're going to get Paul Spector to come back and, and tell us that. We're going to get him to say, okay, we need a date or a timeline. We can't just say, well, maybe. Right. And then we can kind of work backwards. Yep. But I'm not sure what that date is. Any days of the week that are not good for anybody here? Wednesday. 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 <laughs> What's our Wednesday for me too? Uh, Mondays and Tuesdays are usually tough for me. Well, one way to do this, I can send everybody uh, email, like I did before. Okay. Yeah. And, that would uh, help. And good. we can sort it out that way. We should, once we get a, we want to do it every other we get, week. Yeah, but once we yeah. get a day and time we're going to meet, we ought to keep it. Well, yeah, we yeah. that. Right. Yeah, but, that's yeah. best. But this was the first time. Yeah. So as an action item. I'll, uh, I'll canvas everybody by email, yeah. probably do it tomorrow, and, and we'll get uh, sorted out. Now, uh, this may be a little out of the box, but our weekends out? Usually, usually, home may not be usually open for me, though. On the weekends? We do a we retreat, can. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I mean, I, mean I, I can make it work, but I mean, it's... You're, weekends you're are hard right? for me. Yeah. How about late in the afternoon? I can do that. Four or five o'clock meeting? That's good for me. That's fine for me. So, so we can do it afternoons. Uh, I'm assuming Fridays are off. Nobody's going out. Fridays are okay for Friday me. Friday afternoon. Oh, well, we could. We could go out of Tunnel Bar or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure that is. What about, was it a good success in the past number of years being at 5.30? Are typically over at 7 30, 8 o'clock. No, no, we'll, <laughs> we'll run on time. <laughs> get back to you. That's, so that's what we've uh, yeah. worked out very well there. Mm -hmm. It's time for the public to get there at 5 30, and um, it's not a burden for staff either. But it's 5 30 on Thursdays work for most people. Show of hands. Mm -hmm. Thursdays? Yeah. yeah. So maybe and that's I before, that seen, maybe that's before city council, so that's very yeah. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll declare Thursday as a the alternate Thursdays from the council. Hmm? The alternate Thursdays yeah, alternate. from the council, which means it could be next Thursday or three weeks because we're meeting now. I'm correct. Mm -hmm. 
Could you meet next week? Are you willing to meet next week? I can. Yeah. The um, planning board meets Thursday and the conservation committee meets here. Okay. Are they at 7 or at 5? 5.30. Well, I'll find planning board, he says. Does it, does, it have, does it have to be the city space? It could be anywhere. I mean, it's I have, I have, as so, a, yeah, it makes it panic out. I have a wonderful conference room, so if there's something else you want to do, you want to welcome to it. Staff is usually going at 5.30, so it's not, it's not a problem. There's also the beautiful community room at the police department. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll find a place. Yeah. I'm not, I think that's the least about. So 5.30, 7.30? Yep. And so, Emory, will you send out a draft agenda to us a week before the meeting? Well, if we're going to meet next week, uh, there's a certain limitation on the time frame. So I'm just saying we're going to have time to give you feedback, things we'd like to see on the agenda that you want to have enough. The one thing with that open meeting law, we yeah. have to have the agenda posted uh, 24 hours before. So it's got to go to Mary Madura by Wednesday morning at the latest. Because she's got to get it up on the website. 72, I think. No. 48. Is 48. it 48? <laughs> I can't remember if it's 24 or 48. But it okay. has to be working hours. If you I mean, have yeah. some agenda items you want, send me an email. Okay. Just send me email. Okay. Uh, I think this business of going out and playing email tag is not so good. Just okay. if you have some idea you want, uh, let me know. Great. Okay. I'll get it on the agenda. Okay, I'll verify that with Mary and let you know by uh, email, too. And she printed up the last agenda. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we got it right for promotion. Mm -hmm. City, yes? City clerk requires 72 hours notice for postings. Okay. Yeah, but it's, we'll it's not yeah. late, is it, if it's 48 hours? I think it's still not a late yeah, item. It's, it's the witching post. hour is here. Yeah. Okay. okay. I move we adjourn. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate yes. everybody coming. Emory, yeah. was, this, was this something that you wanted? Well, I didn't know how many people were going to come, comments. so I had a... Uh, what is your name? Ruth McGrath. I said we had a lot of guests. Oh, I was going to pass it around to you. Yeah, I live on Ward 6. I live with the many of the bars. I want to make sure you want to play with Ruth McGrath. No. Let's go. He got the street. Yeah. He's got the street. He's got the street. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Are we in charge of our own name?